Kelsey Peach here. Thanks for joining me. Tonight I want to talk to you about the 144,000. To whom does it refer? The Jehovah's Witnesses would like to think that it refers to their group, but in addition to the 144,000, I would like to talk about the mark of the beast, the one world government, the one world religion, and what is commonly called the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men. And I want to make mention of the, what's called the Red Letter Christians. Have you ever heard of that group? Well, I want to tell you a little bit about them and their use of the, what's called the social gospel, which stands in contrast to the true gospel. And also as it pertains to all these things pertain to the immigration problem that we're facing in our country today. Now, believe it or not, all of this is related to one's interpretation of the Bible. Just this morning at the gym, I was talking to a man and he happened to belong to a different denominational group and he was asking me the question, why are there so many different denominational groups? And I pointed out to him that a lot of it had to do with one's interpretation of the Bible. And uh, there are certain groups that when the time of Constantine came on, they changed what normally they would use the literal method of interpretation, they changed it to the allegorical method. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a few moments. But as I start tonight, I want to share with you some three passages of Scripture. And uh, the first one reads this way, Judas went and hanged himself. The second one is, go and do likewise. And the third one is, what you do, do quickly. Now, all three of these passages are from the Scriptures. And if you believe that God's Word is authoritative, my question to you is, why haven't you committed suicide yet? Well, the simple reason has to do with context. In the world of real estate, it's all about location, location, location. But in reference to interpreting the Bible, it has to do with context. What is the immediate context? And what did it mean to the person who wrote it and to the, per and to the people who received the information? Now, when we talk about interpretation, we believe that the Bible is to be interpreted literally. That means it includes figures of speech, uh, similes, metaphors, etc. These are all considered literal interpretation. We also believe that the Bible needs to be interpreted historically in the context in which it, in which it was written and also grammatically. Grammar is a very important part of translating the Bible. Now, if you are consistent throughout the Bible in your interpretation of it, you will soon come to realize that there are distinct dispensations that are found within the pages of Scripture. This morning as I was talking to this man, I was pointing out, I asked him if he took a lamb to church and slit its throat and collected the blood. He said, no. Well, if you don't do that, then you are technically a dispensational, dispensationalist. You believe in different rules for different people in different times. And we believe that there are three major distinctions that we find in the Scriptures, the Mosaic Law, then you also find the principles of grace teaching for today. And there will also be the kingdom rules that are summarized in part in Matthew 7, 5, 6, and 7, which is called the Sermon on the Mount. So we want to talk about some of these things because when you go leave the literal interpretation of the Bible and you go into an allegorical interpret interpretation of the Bible, you can do virtually anything you want with that because you say, oh, it has a deeper meaning. This is, an, this is not what it what God meant. And it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 3 when uh, Satan through, this, through the serpent said to Eve, has God said? And he questioned what God had said. Now God had told Adam not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam conveyed that to Eve. Now he said, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. Now Satan said, God knows that the day that you eat of this fruit, you will become like God. That was true. They would know the difference between good and evil. The lie was, you won't die. Now Eve did not know anything about death. Adam didn't know anything about death. They'd never seen it. it never happened before. So he deceived the woman into believing that his lie, and she partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and became like God in that one area knowing the difference between good and evil but God didn't want that to be so with them and so that's where all the problems begin well anyway uh, 
when we think about interpreting the Bible, it's very important for us to heed, take heed to the words of the Apostle Peter, who said in Second Peter chapter 3, in the last days, and even in his days, there were many false prophets and many teachers who will take the scriptures and they'll twist them to their own advantage. And I'm going to share with you a few things about how this has been done. And so that perhaps you maybe unknowingly have fallen prey to false teachers who have taken the word of God and twisted it to meet their particular agenda. And particularly as it pertains to one of the problems that we have in our country today and has to do with the one world government, the one world religion, the open borders and so forth. And these false teachers are using twisting the scriptures to try to prove to people, maybe you are one of them, and you maybe have come to the belief that, you know, that I need to be involved in this social gospel. So we want to talk about that in just a moment. Now, uh, we know that the leaders of the world are pushing for a one world government and a one world religion. The Bible predicted that this was going to happen. And, uh, and these people are very bold about their desire to have a one world religion and a one world government, a one world currency. And... Uh, it's, it's not a hidden thing anymore. It's right on their agenda. They're planning to do this. And this is what the scriptures said is going to happen. And my friend, believe it or not, it might be just around the corner. Now, it's going to happen, we know for sure, after the church, the true church is gone. Every believer from the day of Pentecost until the time of the rapture who has put his or her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, was buried and rose again. That's the essence of the gospel. These people will be taken out at the time of the rapture, which was not mentioned in the Old Testament. It was a mystery. Once it's revealed, it's no longer a mystery. Now, Jesus first spoke about that in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, when he said to his disciples, Men, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions or dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. But I'm going to go away to prepare a place for all of you. So you're not going to have a little mansion over here and a mansion over there. You know, It's one place for all of us. And I believe that place is described for us in the book of the Revelation, chapter 21 and verse number 9. And I believe that's the place to which we will go at the time of the rapture. Now, I realize that there are some brethren who think that that's not going to be inhabited until the eternal state. I think it's quite easy to prove from Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 9. It says, while... He, the angel revealed this to him while during the time of the tribulation. So I believe that that's the place that Jesus is going to take us to. That's going to be our bridal suite. It'll be the place in which we dwell for the seven years during the time of the tribulation. Now, uh, you see, mankind, the people of this world, are determined to bring about peace without Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. In fact, in Psalm number two, it says, why do the nations rage? Why do they shake their fist at God? And the psalmist advises them by saying, you better bow the knee to Jesus Christ and you better kiss him, so to speak. You better get, in, get right with him. Otherwise, he's going to crush you with a rod of iron. Now, I know that there's some people say, well, no, my Jesus isn't that kind of a Jesus. Then you don't understand Jesus very well because he is going to crush his enemies who will not accept his offer of salvation to them that he provided for them in his dying for their sins on that cross so that they could be saved. And those that reject him as personal savior, this is what he's going to do to them. Now, I know that this doesn't line up with a lot of the politically correct ideas about Jesus, but you check it out for yourself. And in Revelation chapter 19, when he comes back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, what's he going to do? He's going to crush his enemies there at Armageddon. Those who are persecuting the Jews, those who are persecuting the believers, uh, he's going to get rid of all those people. By the, by the word of his mouth, he's going to speak them. He's going to destroy them. And they're going to be judged and cast into the lake of fire. And so it's a very important thing that we understand that there are plans amongst the rulers of this world to bring about a one world government and also a one world religion. Now, in this corresponding with this talk, I will have uh, some links on here for you so that, that you can get the... Uh, the literature that I have here, it's kind of a summary of what I'm sharing with you right now. And I will have some links for you to refer to that other people have written concerning the one world government, the one world church. And so I would invite you to follow along and, and check that out for yourself. Now, we often hear the term, the fatherhood of God, God and the brotherhood of man. We need to clarify that. We are all descendants of Adam and Eve. 
Now, I know that the people who believe in evolution don't agree with that, but the scriptures say we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. You can believe in evolution if you want, or you can believe in creation. You weren't there, I wasn't there, so you have to accept it by faith, right? You can't prove that scientifically. You've got to have repeatable experiences. It, what, it was a one-thing deal that God did. And uh, the reason why so many smart people believe in evolution is because if they acknowledge creation, then they have to, they realize they're accountable to God and they don't want to be accountable to God. And this is one of the main reasons why people accept the theory, not the fact, the theory of evolution that has been taught so many times in our public schools and educational systems that people say, oh, it's just a fact. And yet it's quite easily, dis you can quite easily disprove it mathematically and otherwise just by the fact that you can look out in nature and see that there is a God and the name, he must be powerful. And yet people choose to believe in the theory of evolution because they do not want to take God into their thinking. They want to be the master of their own fate and the captain of their own ship. And it's a very foolish thing to do. Now, so we are all descendants of Adam and Eve in that sense. So we're all blood related, humanly speaking. But in the spiritual realm, we are not related because Jesus himself said to a number of the Jewish people of his day, in fact, the religious leaders in John 8, 44, he says, you guys are of your father, the devil, and you like doing what he, you love to do what he wants you to do. See? Also in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, there are mature sons of disobedience who do the devil's bidding. See, So we are not all children of God, and we don't have one father. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says, very specific, specifically, the Apostle John says, there are, there are people that are in the devil's family and in God's family. Uh, Colossians 1, I believe it's verse number 13, it says, when we get saved, we get taken out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And uh, so you need to recognize that just because you hear a term so often, so many times, that it's true, it is not. Yes, as I mentioned, we all have the same blood. You can intermarry with a person of another race, or not another race, we're all one race, but of another ethnic group, and have children. We're all part of the human race. There's one race, the human race. We did not descend from monkeys and animals and other amoebas and so forth. That is such a far-fetched idea, you know, if this and if this and if this. It's just, it's such a far-fetched idea, and yet people want to believe it. And I hope that you're not one of them, but you will accept what the Scriptures has to say. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God made out of, from all flesh, from one blood, going back all the way to Adam and Eve, we are all descendants of those two people. Now, we also want to point out the fact that the scriptures talk very clearly about the matter of borders, languages, and nations. If you go back to Genesis chapter 10 and 11, you will find out, and well, starting with chapter 9, God told Noah after they survived the flood for that lasted about a year, there was 40 days and 40 nights when it rained, but they stayed in that big ark for about a year, and then they came out, and God said, now, I want you and your descendants to scatter out over the face of the earth. They didn't do that. They gathered them in the place of Shinar and built this tower in Babel. And uh, the head guy was Nim a guy by the name of Nimrod. And after they got building this, this tower, God came down and he confused their languages. And so as these people you know, were working together, now they can't communicate with each other. So this group went this way, that way, and that way. That's where the ethnic groups that we have today come from. And you think about the United Nations, all these nations, where did they come from? It is because God decided, you are disobeying me, I told you to scatter out. And so he changed their languages miraculously. And this group went that way, they started intermarrying. That's why you have different skin colors, people, different hairs, different eye, you know, matter out of the eyes, a little bit more skin than other people have. But believe it or not, folks, we can intermarry with other people of other ethnic groups and have children. And that proves to us that one race is not superior to the other. Now, I know most races, you know, when they are the groups that they think, well, they're superior to the other group. You know, you have the Nazis, you have the Japanese, you have all the, you know, even the Eskimos, you know, are pretty proud of themselves. And, uh, but we're all, we all come from one stock all the way back to Adam and Eve. So there is no, in a technical sense, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. We need to re recognize that if we want to become children of God, we have to be born again from above. By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, who was buried for three days and three nights, and then who rose again bodily 
from the dead on the third day with a glorified resurrected body that is different than our body in that it has flesh and, and bones but no blood. Uh, the, I think the Jehovah's Witnesses, they say, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's true. Flesh and blood, not flesh and bones. You see, Jesus, you go back to Luke chapter 24, and you find out that Jesus had flesh and blood, uh, flesh and bones. He had no blood. Uh, and we maybe will tell you sometime what he did with that blood that he spilled there, that was drained out of him at the cross, what he did as it pertains to the heavenly tabernacle. Now, because the early people in Babel in Babel there they scatter God scattered them out and we find that God is the one according to Acts chapter 17 he is the one that set the boundaries and the borders now when one nation gets out of line too much then he'll bring another nation and he'll conquer them now this was this is what happened to the nation of Israel you see the nation of Israel was supposed to be God's witnesses there in the land of Israel he says you are my witnesses when people come through here, you know, from Africa and Asia and Europe, they come through your territory. I want you to tell them about me, the true and living God. Well, as the people came through, they become, wanted to become more like the nations around them. And they started worshiping their idols. They, uh, they didn't observe the sabbatical year that God said, I want you to observe every seventh year, you're to let the land rest. Oh, we're wasting too much money, you know, we could make more money. God said, let it rest and trust me. They didn't do that. That's the reason, by the way, they went into captivity in Babylon for 70 years because they violated that law for 490 years. That's why it was 70 years. So the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, came over to Israel and they took the southern two tribes, you know, that were the 10 tribes that had already been taken before. They took the two tribes and they took them over into Babylon for 70 years. Well, we believe that Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was a very wicked man and wicked king himself, he became a true believer, I, I think, at least from Daniel chapter 4. He gives his personal testimony. He acknowledges the true and living God. I was thinking just the other day as I had, was having a dream about one of the world rulers and I uh, had a dream of meeting him and I was trying to convey to him, now, if you will humble yourself as Nebuchadnezzar did, then God could use you. See, I won't tell you which country it was, but it's a little short guy from uh, the Oriental country, the Asian country. and uh, But I'm hoping someday maybe I will have the opportunity to speak to um, one of the chief people in, in Japan, having grown up there myself and having gone to school with his uh, younger sister. Anyway, that's another subject in itself, but that may or may not come to pass according to God's will, but I'm willing to do that if God wants me. Anyway, as we get back to this, so God will use nations, and he says, I want you to keep these nations separate. I don't want you to try to bring a, you know, make a one-world government without me, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 talks about uh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, being the, the Prince of Peace. And he's going to rule forever and ever. It's going to start out with a thousand years with believers and unbelievers. And then after the thousand years, it's going to go on into, into eternity. And he will reign forever and ever and ever. Now, this comes as a, as a normal, literal, historical, grammatical interpretation of the Bible. If you believe that way, it will clear up a lot of things in the Bible. Now, one of the things that I encourage you to do is get my dispensations chart. Just go to my website, kelseypeach.com. Look at uh, Understanding the Times. If you want, get a hold of uh, Kim Hayes and Thomas Ice's book, Charting the End Times, a very fine book that I would encourage you to get. And uh, if, if you get that, it will really help you to see the distinctions that you find within the pages of the Scripture. So we need to understand that God made it very clear to the Jews, for example, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 1 through 14, he says, Now, if you obey the Mosaic Law, these are all the blessings that will come upon you. However, if you violate the Mosaic Law, verses 15 and following to the end of the chapter, some about 60-some verses, he says, these are all the curses that are going to come upon you. Now, you see, there are some people today who, who say the church and Israel are the same thing and that the church has replaced Israel. No, it has not. God has not forsaken the Jews. Go to uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 1 and follow. It, Paul says, has God forsaken the Jews? No way. They've been temporarily set aside because of the rejection of Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But it says in Romans 11, 25, when the fullness of time has come in and the Gentiles who are going to be saved are going to be saved, become part of the body of Christ, which beca uh, the, the body of Christ, which becomes the bride of Christ, when that is completed at the rapture, then the 
time clock that God has for the Jews will start up as soon as the Antichrist signs the covenant, the seven-year agreement with the Jewish people. That's when the tribulation is going to begin. So from the time of the rapture until the time that the, the signing of the covenant with the Jews, when the Jews are, something's going to happen that's going to cause the Jews to go back into Israel. Uh, and I've shared that with you in a previous talk. And if you would like the basic chart of that, just let me know and I'll try to, if you didn't get it, I'll try to get that information to you. So we need to understand that God is the one that established borders. And you have to have borders and let you have borders, languages, and this culture and, and finances, you know, a money system. Now, you see, we know that in the time of the tribulation when the Antichrist comes in, the one that's going to sign the covenant, the agreement with the Jews, is going to come from the revived Roman Empire. Now, you can prove that from prove this from Daniel chapter 2 where it talks about the head of gold being the Babylonian Empire, the breast of silver referring to the Medo-Persian Empire, the uh, thighs of bronze referring to the Grecian Empire, the legs referring to the, the Roman Empire, the feet, the ten toes of iron and clay mixed together is talking about the revived Roman Empire. And then you go to Daniel 2, 44 and 45 and you find out that in the end of times that there's a stone that's uh, going to come out of this mountain, strike this image of Nebuchadnezzar and the world kingdoms is going to destroy it and set up that rock is going to go into a, grow into a mountain which will represent, represent the kingdom of the heavens over which Jesus Christ himself will be the ruler and uh, perhaps we'll share more information with you on that a little bit later now I have a lot of references in my notes here that I would like for you to check out for yourself and the reason I do that is I don't go into all these verses, you know, on this broadcast here because uh, you'd probably get tired and bored. But if you're a serious student of God's Word, I would encourage you to just download this information. I'll have it for you. You can just click on there, print it out, and check these things out for yourself. Do further study and maybe share it with other people. Uh, we really appreciate if you're being blessed by these talks that you share them with your friends and your family and other people because, you know, you can be... A, a good witness for Jesus Christ just by pushing share. Did you know that? That's right. Maybe you don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel. With it's very simple, and I'm going to have a link that Dr. Manfred Cobra has. You know, do we really believe the gospel? And you can read that article. I've uh, had it there on previous occasions. Now, one of the things that is very confusing to people is found in what's called the Olivet Discourse. Now, it's called the Olivet Discourse because it was given to the disciples on the Mount of Olives, which is just east of Jerusalem there. You go through the Kidron Valley, I've been to that place, and Jesus was asked by his disciples, he says, when are these things going to be when all the temple is going to be torn down? And so they ask him three questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming in the third, the end of the age? And he starts out by answering the third question, but he tells them what's going to happen in the future. He tells them about the tribulation time that is mentioned in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27. It says it's going to, that it's, it's also referred to in the latter part as the time of Jacob's trouble. You see, during the first half of the tribulation, the Jews are going to be protected by the Antichrist for the first three and a half years. He's made an agreement with them. But when they don't bow down to him in the middle of the tribulation, that's when he goes after them full bore. And he's going to try to wipe them off the face of the earth once and for all. So in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, you have what's called the Olivet Discourse. Now this was addressed to Jesus' disciples. The church had not begun yet. And you need to keep this in mind because the church did not begin until the day of Pentecost as is found in Acts chapter 2. So... He's talking to his disciples and he's telling them, what are these things going to be? And so he talks about, first of all, about the first half of the tribulation. And then in Matthew 24, 15, he says, But when you, in the middle of the tribulation, see the false prophet putting an image of the Antichrist in the temple where the Jews have been offering their sacrifices, he says, you guys who are Jews in that land, you better head out as fast as you can down to Petra. Now that's mentioned in Isaiah chapter 16 and verse number 1. But this is where it's talking about in Matthew 25, uh, 24, 5, uh, verse 15. He says, you better flee as fast as you can. Now, you see, here's what's going to happen. In the middle of the tribulation, you have God sealing the 144,000 Jews. They're mentioned in uh, Revelation chapter 7. They're from the 12 tribes. They're not referring to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, I don't care what the Jehovah's Witnesses is. It's talking about 12 tribes from the nation of Israel. Okay, these 
144,000, if you divide them into two, you have, uh, what is it, uh, 72 teams, okay, of twos. And they're going to go and carry the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel that we have today, but the gospel of the kingdom that will quite probably include the gospel of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, but perhaps an added element of his return, his soon return. Because here these Jews are going to be, and the world is going to be persecuted, and they're going to need, God's going to need some witnesses here on earth. Now, you know, these false prophets, the health, wealth, and happiness guys who say, send me your money, we're going to take the gospel. They don't even present the gospel of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. They talk about, you know, health and prosperity and all this other kind of stuff. Don't waste your money sending, you know, send your, sending your money to them. If they don't, when they present the gospel, if they don't tell you that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if they make other conditions for salvation, whether it's a social gospel, whether it's lordship salvation, or anything else, don't get involved with them. See? The gospel is very clear. And the condition for salvation is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That word believe is used a hundred times approximately in the gospel of John as the condition. The word repent means to change your mind. And some guys have taken that word and to mean, well, you got to stop sinning. Well, my friend, if I could stop sinning, you would you really need God? You can't do it on your own. That's not what the word repent means. When you find it in the scriptures, it means a change of mind. You check it out in the Greek language. It means to change your mind. Now, of course, if you have a genuine change of mind, it's going to result eventually in your change of life. See, But... Uh, to make it, to make the word repent, to stop sinning and do all these other things that, you know, these lordship in exchange for salvation guys are talking about. You see, we believe in lordship because of salvation, not lordship for salvation. And we've talked about this. If you're a genuine believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. As Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in light of the mercies of God that have been shown to you, present your body to God as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to him, which is your reasonable thing to do. And stop being conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This corresponds with 1 Peter 3.15. And set aside Christ as the master or the Lord of your life. Be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks a reason of the hope that you have within you with meekness and fear. This follows salvation. is not a condition for salvation. See? Now, don't be misled by these uh, lordship in exchange for salvation guys. Uh, you don't have to confess every sin that you've ever committed in your life before you can be And, in fact, I would encourage you to go to my website and read this. It's the bad news, the good news. And Ron Shea does a very excellent job of talking about all the conditions that are imposed upon people today before they supposedly can be saved. No, there's one condition. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins. When you believe that, you're admitting you're a sinner. Uh, just recently, I talked to somebody at the gym and uh, this person told me that she was a very wonderful person. And I asked her, I said, well, why should God let you into heaven? And her response was, why shouldn't he? Look at all the good things that I've done. And I said, well, I said, you know, the scripture says that it's not of works lest any man should boast. You see, if you got into heaven because you did more works than I did, you'd have something to brag about. But it is not of works lest anybody should boast. No, we're saved by God's grace through faith. In the person of Jesus Christ who died for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the whole world. We don't believe in what's called limited atonement, that Christ only died for the elect. No, he died for the sins of the whole world. Now, all whom the Father has given to the Son are going to come to him, and him who comes to, to Christ, he will in no wise cast out. There is no excuse for you or anybody else for not being able to be saved. God offers salvation to mankind, not to the fallen angels to all of mankind, and you're included in that group. And I want you to help me get this message out to your family and friends and fellow workers, because if you just simply push share, we can get this message out. Uh, we don't change the gospel. We're not free to change the gospel. We don't, we, you know, there are people who believe in vain. They know the facts of the gospel. They believe the facts of the gospel. You know, I, I heard this song, church, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in God the Father, you know, all these things. You can believe the facts without transferring your trust over the person and work of Jesus Christ. You know, and if you don't do that, you won't be saved. Maybe you know the facts. Maybe you believe the facts. But my friend, have you transferred your faith and trust over to the person and work of Jesus Christ once and for all? It's a once for all transaction. I don't particularly like this idea of following Jesus because 
If you, if you look in the Gospels, it talks about the disciples. The disciples were learners who were being taught, but not every one of those disciples was a true believer. Whenever, beginning when the, in the book of Acts, you find disciple, and I was just looking it up earlier. Whenever you have the word disciple, it's used of a true believer. So he says, make disciples, true believers, baptize them. So they'll give evidence of their identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And then teach them whatsoever I've commanded you, going back to John 13, 34, and 35, which is the new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. We don't go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. That was given to the Jews. It was not given to the church. Now, are there certain principles in the Sermon on the Mount that might be transferable? Yes, there are similarities, but similarity is not identity, and we need to make that distinction. So... Uh, when he talks in this passage in Matthew, 20, I got a little sidetrack there. In Matthew twenty-four, he says, "If you have, if you have done these things to the least uh, of my brethren, uh, if you've fed, uh, let's see, what is it here? If you, um, if you fed the hungry, if you gave a drink to the thirsty, if you took in the stranger, if you clothed the naked, he says, inasmuch as you have done it to these, the least of my brethren." Now, I pointed out to you that the word brethren does not refer to unsaved people. And I believe it, it's more than just the Jews, because the Jews at this particular time were down in, in Petra, in that bowl-shaped area, where God himself is going to protect the Jews so they don't get annihilated. So it's not referring to them, I don't believe. It's referring, however, to the 144,000 that are going about here and there, and the people who have not taken the mark of the beast will be those who will receive their message, and when they believe and are saved, they are willing to share what little water they have and what little grubs, worms, whatever they're trying to survive on, they'll be willing to share that with these 144,000 that have come to their door. That's who these brethren refer to, not all the people of the world. That's not what it's talking about. But you see, the social gospelites guys have twisted this uh, to mean everybody. No, that's not what it's talking about. And so the brethren is a reference, we believe, to the 144,000. Now, there are people who are involved in what's called the social gospel. And I'll invite you to check this out on, on the links that I'll have here. But the social gospel changes the true gospel, and they, it goes something like this. Go into all the world and feed the hungry, clothe the naked, build homes for the poor and care for the sick, become politically and socially active in order to eliminate the great social problems of our day, in order to impose biblical standards upon society, or to change the world for Christ. That is not what we do today. The ship is going down, my friend. We present the good news concerning Christ. And when they do that, people's lives get transformed. We do not include the social gospel. Now, a natural result from our being saved will be good works. But that's a personal thing. That's not something that the government, God is imposing on the government to do here in the Sermon on the Mount. See, but these guys do that. Now, maybe you've never heard of Red Letter Christians, and you, I'll give you some links that you can go to and check out for yourself. But these people use Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and they say that the red letters, which refer to Jesus' actual words, are more important than the rest of the Scriptures. My friend, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scriptures God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we believe that all scriptures God breathed. Not all of it, of it is to us. All of it is for us. And we need to make that distinction. Now, what these guys have done, the red letter Christian, is they have taken the words of Jesus that were given to the Jews, not to the church, and they try to impose those, whatever they pick and choose. See? They don't take the words of Jesus that are found in the, in the, uh, in the uh, upper room discourse mentioned in, uh, found in John 13, 14, 15, and 16. They don't take those words usually because these are anticipatory of what's going to take place, what is revealed to us in the epistles primarily that were written by Paul, Peter, John, James, and Jude. See? So those are New Testament truths that we apply for ourselves. And if you don't see these distinctions, my friend, you're going to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. If a smooth preacher comes up, oh, it sounds so good, I must be doing this, you know, and then you get involved in, in assisting, aiding, and abetting the one world government and the one world church that is coming. Now, just because you fall for that doesn't mean that you're unsaved, okay? But in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says many Christians are, going, are tossed about in the, like a cork on their wild raging sea. And my friend, we don't want you to we don't want you to be that way if you're a Christian. 
you shouldn't be deceived by false teachers. Peter talked in 2 Peter chapter 2. He says they're gonna, there were false prophets in the Old Testament. There are false teachers today. Paul talked about it. Jude talked about it. Peter talked about it. And you need to be aware of the things that are going on. So we believe that once we are saved, there are good works for us to do. James, the half-brother of Jesus, talks about in James 2.20. He says, now, as far as other people are concerned, if you want to show them that you're a true Christian, you have to do that by your good works. Now, your good works don't save you as far as God is concerned, but they will give evidence to other people who say, well, show me your faith by your works and I'll believe you. You can't just say, well, I believe, you know, it says the demons believe in, in God and, and yet they're not saved. So just making a profession is not enough for people to recognize that you're a true believer. And even though you're saved, you might sometimes act like an unsaved person. You might become carnal. Now, there's some guys that say there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Easy to disprove. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. A guy living incestuously with his mother or his stepmother. He was a saved man. Uh, Christians do sin. We have a sin nature. Paul had one. He talks about in Romans 7, verses 15 through 25. You have one. If you say you have no sin nature, you're just deceiving yourself. Whether you're saved or unsaved, you have, a, you have a sin nature. You will have it until the day you die. Now, I hope that this has been helpful for you. Uh, I realize there's much, much more that we could talk about as far as these different subjects are concerned, but I would encourage you to uh, check, you know, download this information, print it out, look up the scripture references. But you know the main thing is, have you been born again from above? Are you a true child of God? If you are a child of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins and rose again, then we want to help you grow in the sphere of grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to show you what God wants you to do as far as good works are concerned. We want you to share your faith with others. One way you can do this, I mentioned earlier, just push share. And uh, this will get out to your friends. And if they share it with their friends, it can grow exponentially. And we want to reach people of the world with the good news concerning Christ. Uh, I would like to find a way to uh, do this with reference to the Japanese people. My parents and grandparents spent many, many years in Japan. And, uh, but if people get involved, the Christians will get involved in sharing the good news. And, and sometimes, if necessary, translating things for others so that they can be saved. Uh, this uh, God's Simple Plan of Salvation that Ford Porter wrote many years ago, it's in 126 languages. This is in Spanish, and uh, you can get a hold of those. There are some that you can even send by email to other people to help them in their uh, understanding of the Scriptures. We want you to grow in the sphere of grace. We want you to live in the light of Christ's any moment of return. If you do that, you can earn the crown of righteousness that doesn't fade away. We don't want you to get caught up by the false teachers, their false doctrines. Um, but help us share the good news with other people and messages like this so that uh, the Christians can keep on growing and you can have a part in us with us in this matter. Now, we're here to help those that are teachable and willing to change. Uh, you can't teach somebody who's not willing to change. I mean, you can teach them, but it doesn't do any good. But if you're willing to change, you're teachable and willing to change. Uh, as I mentioned to some fellow this morning I was talking to at the gym, I said, you know, I've been studying this book for a long time, but I don't have all the answers. And if I don't have an answer, I'll try to find one. And even if I try to find one, I may not still have I don't. I probably won't know, I won't know everything there is to know in the Scriptures until I get to heaven. But I'll be happy to share with you and others. If you're teachable and willing to change, please uh, send your questions and comments to us, and we'll do our, our very best to, uh, to share that information with you. Now, I'll have on this uh, corresponding um, article here that I'll put in just a few moments on my website, and it'll have a, a link that deals with the one world religion, what the gospel is and what it is not, and about the red letter Christians and a few other things. So I hope that you will avail yourself of this. And uh, if you need to, every once in a while I need to have, have my thinking corrected. And scripture is good for doctrine. Uh, everything is to be believed, not everything is to be believed in practice. We need to be reproved sometimes. We need to be corrected. We need to be instructed in the right way to live. And we want to help you do that. And so until next time, my friend, this is Kelsey Peach asking God's blessing upon you as you are obedient to him and his word.